With this module, we're going to start talking about crystallography. We've wrapped up light microscopy, where the kind of key to this was diffraction uh, that formed these images. Now we're going to move on and talk about crystal geometry and structure, and we want to know how x-rays um, are diffracted by these crystals, and that will be what's sort of what's coming up with crystallography. But first we need to know a little bit more about how crystals are put together and so forth. So we're going to start with that. And so when we talk about a crystal, we're talking about a solid and it's composed of atoms. It could be composed of ions uh, or molecules. And they're arranged, and this is the key, in a pattern. And that pattern is periodic in three dimensions. So that's what we mean by, by a crystal. So when we talk about crystals, we're talking about something that's a solid, but also has a periodic uh, pattern to its structure. All right, so we can also have solids um, that are composed of the same things, but are not periodic. And those are what we call amorphous. So these could be amorphouses, uh, amorphous materials. Uh, sometimes we call this uh, inorganic uh, glass. So if we're talking about things like window glass, this is inorganic. It could also be an organic uh, glass, so mini polymers uh, have an amorphous behavior, and for the most part, um, all polymers will have some component of amorphous to them. Uh, and there can also be things like what we call liquid metals, so amorphous metals, right? So when we talk about liquid metals, we're not actually talking about the liquid state, we're talking about uh, uh, solid metals, uh, but they don't have that periodic nature. So those are also uh, amorphous. So this is just kind of the um, amorphous kind of umbrella term, but you can also see a lot of other terms that represent the same thing. So when we start uh, talking about crystals, uh, we like to kind of ignore the actual atoms. Or you know, again, atoms, ions, or molecules. I'm not, I'll probably stop saying all, all three of those, but we kind of ignore the actual thing that it's composed of, and then just focus. So we instead focus on the geometry of what we call the periodic array. So this, uh, when we talk about a 3D uh, array of lattice points, uh, we t uh, each of them is surrounded with identical surroundings. So this is the lattice. So when we start, uh, when we, so basically what I'm trying to say here is that when we start the um, discussion of crystals, we kind of ignore the actual atoms, ions, and molecules that compose it, and just focus on the periodic array and treat where those atoms, ions, and molecules go as what we call lattice points. So that's how we're going to start, and let's start with a uh, one-dimensional lattice. So, you know, we're going to build up and we want to ultimately talk about three-dimensional lattices, but let's start with 1D. So let's say I have a one-dimensional 1D lattice. So, all right, let's start with the 1D lattice, one-dimensional. So all this is is just a line. With points on it, so it's it's a really simple concept, but we're going to build up from this. And the line with these points is separated 
by a what we call lattice translational vector. So basically, and I'm going to put that as A with the arrow on top to represent that it's a lattice. So basically, this is just the lattice, or sorry, this is just the vector separating the points. And so um, the length of that uh, vector, we call that the lattice parameter. And we call that A, so A without the vector, so just the length. So really what I'm talking about here is, let's say I draw a point, right? A point in space. So if this is a 1D lattice, what I'm saying is I'm going to have a vector that goes from this one point, so this will be A, and um, it's of certain length, A, and it goes to another point, right? And then we have, uh, we use that same vector, same direction, same length, and we go to another point. And we keep doing that. So all of these should be the same length and direction, giving us another point. So that's why we call it periodic, right? Because we have a point and then a certain space and direction between those points, and that is the vector A. And so we keep we keep going for that infinitely, right? In in practice. Right. So that length here is A without the vector. Right? So this is all the one-dimensional lattice is. So basically the idea here is we can start with this point, right? Start with that point. So we can start with any given point. And we can translate, move, by some integer n times the vector a. And that'll bring us to another point. Right. So we have the predictive capability. If we know where one point in space is, we know how to get to another one or another one or another one by some integer, right? So this is basically n equal 1, n equal 2, n equal 3 n equal 4, etc., away from the first point. So that's the idea with this simple lattice. So it's a very simple concept, uh, but I want to start out with it in one dimensions. So now let's visit this in 2D. So a 2D lattice, so we're basically building up our dimension to this. And so this is going to be planar as opposed to linear. So this is a planar lattice, and this is going to be consisting of two non-collinear lattice vectors. And so we use the same convention, so we're going to have an A vector and a B vector. So that's going to be our new one. And that, they are separated by an angle. Sorry. And we're going to call that gamma. So the angle separating those two um, is gamma. So we can do the same thing and you can kind of envision this in the same way. We start with a given point. Um, we can translate a given angle B, or sorry, A, a, a certain vector A, and get to a point. But we also have the ability of translating a given um, vector B and getting to another point here, right? And so we can get to A and then translate by B. So any, so, and we can keep kind of going this framework of translating 
and you know and so on and so on um, so the idea is that we can have any again we're translating so we're moving uh, in given directions so we can train any we can have any translation of the combination n a so basically an integer times the vector a plus an integer and we're going to call this one b or sorry p uh, times b <laughs> Uh, sorry for the confusion there. So uh, both n and p are integers. So this will so any translation of that uh, that form uh, return us us to another point. Right, so uh, I can go, for example, I can go one integer of a and zero of b and get to this point. I can go one of each, right? So one uh, vector of b, or sorry, one vector of a, one vector of b, and get to another point. So one and one, and any combination will take me to one of these points, right? As long as n and p are integers, and so it gives me this mesh or planar lattice. Uh, and two dimensions, right? So this is in the plane of the paper in this case. So that's what we mean by a two-dimensional lattice. And you can see we're just kind of building this up. And the next one is going to be the three-dimensional lattice. All right, that brings us to the 3D lattice. And it's, again, just an extension of what we talked about with the one and then the 2D lattice. So with that, with the 2D lattice, we had... Um, lattice translational vectors a and b which correspond to two non-collinear directions in the plane um, so now we're going to have a b vectors and then we're going to as you might have suspected add a third one and we're going to call that c with the the arrow to represent the, the vector and uh, with that we're going to have more angles between these vectors. So uh, we'll have angles of alpha, beta, and gamma. And those are the angles between B and C. So basically, we have the angle between A and uh, B and C uh, translates to alpha. Then we have A and C that's going to be beta. So basically it's the, uh, if you know sort of the Greek letters, then A and B, so it's going to be, or sorry, A and C, it's going to be beta. B and C, it's going to be alpha. So it's the other one that's not involved in these two. And then we also have A and uh, B, sorry, A and B, and that's the same, that's uh, gamma. So I can draw some arrows to, to give you those, right? So those are going to be our three angles involved with these um, this three-dimensional lattice. All right. So uh, speaking of 3D lattices and the three translational vectors A, B, and C, and angles between all of those, again, the concept is the same. We can take a point, excuse me, uh, we can take one of these points, any one of these points, right? and translate by some combination of a, b, and c vectors, uh, integers multiplied by that, and get to another point, right? And so this is basically this three-dimensional lattice that we're talking about. All right, so when we talk about three-dimensional lattices, um, and we have this combination of a, b, and c, um, that, that I've mentioned here, the A, B, and C vectors, it's important to also remember uh, from maybe some other uh, math classes or physics classes, if you remember the, the right hand rule. So my right hand right here, and there's a couple different ways to do it, but um, I like to start with um, you know the index finger, middle finger, and the thumb, right? That's the That can be one version of the right hand rule. So if I say that this A vector is going to be my index finger, right? Then I point that. Then that means that the middle finger 
is going to be the B vector, right? So that tells me that the thumb, which is going to be sticking up, right, is my A cross B. And the A cross B, uh, if you remember from vectors, uh, is going to be the C, right? So I have A, I have A, B, and then C, right? So that's the right-hand rule. Uh, and that's kind of helpful if you want to think about the connection between uh, those three. So we, you have to follow the right-hand rule uh, in these cases. So that's important to, to remember. But again, keep in mind that any combination of these, N times A, P times B, and then we can come up with another vector for C, uh, any combination of that will get you to another point on that lattice I showed you on the screen. So the combination of these vectors, uh, A, B, and C, instead of drawing, drawing that whole lattice, we can define what we call, so we can define something called a unit cell. So this is a uh, terminology you're going to see over and over. And again, this, uh, all it is is a basic construction of these three vectors. And so this is going to, you can refer to this as a prism uh, or a parallel pipid. Um, and so it's going to be a, it's going to have a volume if we're looking at uh, the combination uh, of this. And so the idea here is that we, you know, start with a, you know, a given point, and we look at uh, uh, translation uh, in an a direction, translation. So this is a, b, and then let's say this is c, right? So we can basically make a volume out of those three points. Draw that as best as I can. <laughs> so that is our um, that is our parallel pipid uh, consisting of our uh, three vectors a, b, and c. And so we uh, basically this gives us a volume. And so this is what we refer to as the unit cell. And we can the reason we think about unit cells like this uh, is because this is the smallest volume we can think about, right? We don't have to draw that whole, um, you know, every point. It's, this thing is going to be infinite, and so we can just represent it by this smallest volume here, uh, and this can still tell you uh, the, the overall um, periodicity, how it's structured, um, for a much larger structure, even if we just draw this small little part. So that's kind of the power of looking at this unit cell. So we have this parallel pipid, and then we know that the length of this is uh, this direction, sorry, this direction is A, this direction, the length is B, and this is C, and then we have angles gamma, beta, and this angle is alpha, right? So the angle between all of those, right? So this whole thing tells you everything we need to know relating to these vectors and the links and the angles, right? So just drawing this, it tells us everything uh, we need to know. And so when we think about this, again, you can think about the points on each of those vertices that we have, right? And so I can get from one to another by translations of A, B, and C. That's the idea with this. And we only have, if we think about these, we have, we're showing eight points, right, uh, in this. Uh, but with this unit cell, we only have one lattice point per unit cell, right? So the reason this is, this is the case is if you think about this, each one of these points in this volume is not entirely in the volume. Only a 
fraction of that point is inside this volume here, right? This point is shared by other volumes around it if we continue to draw these unit cells, right? If I draw another unit cell over here and above it, right, this point will be shared in it. So uh, basically you have to take one eighth of each of these points and we have eight of them. And so that gets us to the one lattice point per unit cell. So when this is the case, when we only have one point at each of these vertices, this is known as primitive. Another term for that um, you might see is simple because it's not, you know, again, it's just one point per vertice, so it's very simple or primitive. So that's where we get these, uh, th this terminology for it. Another way we can think about this one lattice point per unit cell is to go back to the drawing I have here on the screen for um, the 3D lattice. And instead of drawing the uh, boundaries um, at the lattice points, right? So we had A, B, and C associated with these lattice points. Well, if we shift it, um, and we shift it by uh, half, so half of the length of each vector, we can redraw this lattice unit cell, right? This unit cell is the same thing as it was before, it's just shifted. And in this case, we can see that now the, the vertices here, each corner is not going to be centered on a lattice point. Instead, it's going to be, um, it's going to be so that we only have one lattice point and it's right in the center um, of this unit cell. So that's another way of visualizing that we only have one unit cell associated with this, uh, sorry, one lattice point associated with each unit cell. So we can just draw it um, in a different place and see that that's the case. So it doesn't, you know, it hasn't changed anything. We're just drawing this unit cell in a different location. So in this case, it's centered on one of those points. Um, and it tells us that, again, we only have one lattice point per unit cell, which we call primitive or simple.